in our S. Whitehead Memorial Lecture. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Honorable Paul Whitehead Jr. for establishing this lecture series as a memorial to his wife Sandra, who many of us knew and loved. A special welcome uh, to the family. We have daughter Bill, sons Paul III, and Robert and his wife Melissa here in the front row. Also, Eva Stone, Sandra's mother. Thank you for being here. President Raymond and Cindy Lee, thank you for being here. Both Paul and Sandra were dedicated docents for many years. Both of them led tours for countless Lynchburg City school children. The Whiteheads each had their distinctive styles, very different from one another. But the children were transfixed by both by Sandra for her warmth and beautiful, soothing voice, and by Paul for his presence and charm. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> a lecture series focused on the collection that Sandra valued so much is such a fitting tribute. Thank you, Paul. our speaker today, my friend and respected colleague, Ellen Agnew. Ellen received her BA degree in art history from Randolph-Macon Women's College in 1980, and her MA degree in art history from Binghamton University in 1983. Ellen worked here at the Mayor Museum of Art for 23 years, from 1984 to 2007, initially as the mayor's first full-time curator and director, and then as part-time associate director. Prior to that, she worked at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia. While at the mayor, she organized over 100 exhibitions, including a five-city national tour of selections from the collection. It was a major exhibition supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and featured a large portion of the collection. I had the privilege of working alongside Ellen for five years, from 2002 to 2000 when I served as Curator of Education. She is now an independent curator whose exhibition, Inside Looking Out, the Art of Queen Estoval, is currently at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. If you haven't, if you haven't seen it, go to Richmond and see it. The exhibition and catalog were organized by the Dora Gallery of the University of Lynchburg. Ellen returns to the Mayor Museum both to celebrate her many years of friendship with Paul and Sandra Whitehead, and to honor Sandra's memory by presenting the first annual Sandra S. Whitehead Memorial Lecture. Welcome, Ellen.
importance in our community. Holland Sanders' gift of Bernie Monk to the Mayor Museum of Art is part of the continuum going back over a century that embodies the important altruistic partnership of artists, collectors, art dealers, and a college community in building this collection of American art. It began with Louise Jordan Smith, the first art professor at Randolph-Macon Women's College, who believed it imperative that students study masterpieces of American art firsthand. As a result, the Mayor Museum of Art has one of the finest collections of American art in the country. And by the way, um, that assertion was made to me years ago by Franklin Kelly, senior curator of American and British art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Along with the Whiteheads, there are others who have been a part of this partnership who are relevant to today's presentation. I agreed to include two other Wyeth paintings in my remarks that were gifts to the Mayor Museum of Art. On the left, Jamie Wyeth's Pumpkin at Sea, a watercolor from 1971, was purchased in 1986 as a result of a bequest left by Margaret Henry Gamble. Randolph Macon Women's College, class of 1920. On the right, Andrew Weiss' watercolor, On Teal's Island, purchased in 1973 by Rosella Nellie Schuel, was given this year. In 1995, I attended the American Association of Museums annual conference in Philadelphia. The keynote address was given by distinguished historian and author David McCullough in a room holding over 5,000 museum professionals. Over the course of his 45-minute presentation, spoken without a single note card, piece of paper, or visual, one could have heard a pin drop. McCullough's subject was the importance of storytelling in engaging audiences, whether they be readers of history or viewers to museums. My revelation, as he concluded, was that his presentation had taken the form of a story that had, in riveting fashion, captured his audience of thousands in rapt silence. I have never forgotten the sense of communal engagement in the room that day and the lasting impact of our shared humanity in listening together. McCullough gave a simple yet powerful example, first set by British novelist E.M. Forster, of how stories can engage and lead to deeper understanding by contrasting two sentences. The first, the king died and then the queen died. And the second, the queen died, the king died, and then the queen died of grief. The first sentence is a sequence of events. The second is a story, a story with emotional content and empathy for both the teller and the listener. My intent is that the stories I share today will enrich your understanding of On Teal's Island, Burning Off, and Pumpkin at Sea. In giving context, I hope for deeper meaning, and with deeper meaning, a greater understanding and appreciation for these three remarkable works of art and their place in a remarkable collection. Andrew Wise said, quote, I think one's art goes as far and as deep as, one, as one's love goes. I see no reason for painting but that. If I have anything to offer, it is my emotional contact with the place where I live and the people I do. Born in 1917, Andrew Wyatt lived his whole life in two places, Chadsford, Pennsylvania, and Cushing, Maine. These two locations shaped Wyatt's art and life in profound ways and furnished the entire content of his art, from fields, farmhouses, barns, plows, and the sea, to family, friends, and neighbors who inhabited those places with him. As a boy, Wyatt was sickly. It was realized later to be tuberculosis. And so he was taken out of school in first grade and never returned. As a result, from his youth, Wyatt roamed the land surrounding his two homes, becoming one with its nature. <coughs> Being at home allowed Andrew a unique childhood, both in terms of the freedom of outside exploration and exposure to, to the work of his father, artist N.C. Wyatt, seen standing second from the right. 
N.C. Wise was famed for his commissioned paintings for book illustrations, including classics such as Treasure Island. Under the tutelage of illustrator Howard Pyle, N.C. was taught to be an artist first and then an illustrator. Along with composition, drawing, and painting techniques, Pyle emphasized the importance of drama and emotional content, which he believed arose from the artist's personal connection to his or her subject. N.C. adopted that philosophy in his work and in his teaching of his son, Andrew, who began rigorous training, as Andrew's quote, incessant drilling in drawing, construction from the cast, from life, and from landscape, end quote in his father's studio at age 14. As a young artist, Andrew learned from the imaginative and romantic artistic creations of his father, such as the painting on the left for the book Robin Hood, and fed his own imagination and creativity by reenacting many of the adventures represented in his father's work, as seen on the right where he's photographed in the center playing Robin Hood with siblings and friends. Needless to say, N.C.'s influence formed a strong foundation, one that carried Andrew, Andrew throughout his career, and one that he passed down to his own son, Jamie. Even N.C.'s costume collection, handed down to him from his mentor, Howard Pyle, maintained its place of importance, finding its way into family skits and holidays, especially at Christmas and Halloween. Thus, the realm of the imagination was utterly real and every day in the Wyatt household. <clears throat> While N.C. and Andrew shared common traits that shaped their art, such as keen observational skills, extraordinary technical abilities, and strong emotional content, Andrew was able to apply those traits to subjects that interested him, rather than to subjects imposed upon him through commissions, as had been the case with his father. Andrew's spiritual connection to place imbued the landscapes, structures, and objects he represented with the same emotional content as the portraits of people he crafted. Andrew's brother-in-law, Peter Hurd, who was a student of NC's when Andrew was eight and who later married one of Andrew's sisters, said of NC, who was pictured in this self-portrait, quote, he taught us in painting to equate ourselves with the object, to the point that we become the object itself. Andy does this. He, takes, he makes people out of things, and that person is also himself, and vice versa. It's a curious, mysterious, wonderful thing. Nowhere is that concept more aptly illustrated than in Andrew Wyeth's only self-portrait entitled Trodden Weed from 1951. Andrew said of the painting, a self-portrait, it was after a dangerous eight-hour operation on my lungs. Afterward, I walked and walked the country around Chad's, getting my strength back, wearing these French cavalier boots which belonged to the painter Howard Pyle. As I walked, I had to watch my, watch my feet because I was so unsteady. And I suddenly got the idea that we all stupidly crush things underfoot and ruin them without thinking. Like the weed here getting crushed, that black line is not merely a compositional device. It's the presence of death. Before my operation, I had been looking at Albrecht Dürer's work. During the operation, they say my heart stopped once. At that moment, I could see Dürer standing there in black, and he started coming at me across the tile floor. When my heart started, he, Dürer, death, receded. So this painting is highly emotional, dangerous, and looming. In this context, let's, let's consider Wyeth's watercolor on Teal's Island. In 1947, a schoolmate of Wyeth's aunt, who was an artist named Ella Miriam Wood, was asked by Andrew to paint a portrait of one of his sons in exchange for one of Andrew's paintings. She chose the undated watercolor on Teal's Island that includes a man named Henry Teal seated on a dory.
Henry, or Hen Teal, was born on Teal's Island near Cushing in the late 1870s. The island was named for the seven generations of Teals, who had lived there and made their living from the sea. Teal lived his whole life on the mile-long island, summer and winter, until age 75, when illness forced him to move off the island in 1954 to die. While on the island, he lived alone and only visited the mainland to deliver lobsters or get provisions. In 1945, at a point early in their friendship, Teal posed for a painting, Wife Did of Him, seated in his favorite chair by the window in his house, looking out to sea. It was said that the minute Teal came into his house, though he might have been out on the water since dawn, he would go right to the window for a look outside. This was the only occasion Teal sat for Wyatt, for he was perpetually busy clamming, fixing his lobster traps, or looking after the sheep he ran on the island. So instead, in 1950, Wyatt first sketched and then painted in meticulous detail in tempera Teal's dory including his dory oar, which was much like teal, long, worn, thin, weathered, and gray. Wyeth wrote, Hen would go, would go out early to tend his traps, and I could hear his squeaking oar locks and the sound of the trap hauled up and let drop down. He knew every bit of the water he rode in so well, it was just a part of him. He'd land on the beach, step the oars, and get out all in one motion. The only sound was the sea lapping on the beach and reflected on the sides of the dory, shells on the sand, and swooping barn swallows. The dory was like a child to him. I painted it as a portrait of him, called it spindrift. The word spindrift is a noun meaning the spray blown from the crests of waves by the wind. Its use as a title seems contradictory to the serene, still, and quiet portrayal of Hen's story. But then perhaps this dichotomy is appropriate to what the half-beached dory represents, both Hen on land in the quiet solitude of his home and Hen hard at work in the elements at sea. Wyatt completed more than 100 paintings on and related to Teal's Island. Henry Teal's house is shown up close from a high vantage point, looking out over the roof line and lightning rod towards the ocean in Northern Point from 1950. From the distant shoreline where a dory would be beached with a tiny square of ghostly light shining out of the kitchen window in the Island House from 1955. And from a low vantage point on the grass coming up from the beach, with the weather-beaten roof and its barely visible lightning rod, rod atop to the left on the horizon in Teal's Island from 1954 in Dry Brush. This painting was done after Teal died. Wyeth described how he had come ashore and saw that Teal has draw, had drawn his old wooden skiff up beyond the tide, as though he knew he wouldn't be using it again. He said, Henry Teal had a punt, and one day he hauled it up on the bank and went to the mainland and died. I was struck by the ephemeral nature of life when I saw the boat there just quietly going to pieces. So how does On Teal's Island fit into the context of wise paintings we have viewed? One must first look to answer the question of its date. We know that it was acquired by Ella Wood directly from the artist in 1947, so examining the works prior to this period proved insightful. Wise's first recognition as an artist came with two solo watercolor exhibitions at Macbeth Gallery in New York in 1937 and 1939, when the artist was 20 and 22 respectively. In those watercolors of the late 30s, Wyeth used loose brushwork and strong colors, such as in Cat of Nine Tales of 1936 on the left and Lobster Traps from 1939 on the right. He said, 
Here I was, 19, and sitting in the tide pools with mussels and rockweed and smell of salt air and flashing sunlight and clouds and shadows. I was full of swashbuckling, pain for dear life, excited that I had all these colors. Wines garnered immediate success with the, those early, bold, expressive watercolors, selling out his first show in two days. Then in 1939, Wyeth met his future wife, Betsy, and discovered temper paint and said, it all merged into something deeper. Emotions really became the most important thing. It was a very strong turning point, and I got rid of the fireworks. He went on to say, I was getting interested in making an object look like an object. I'd get so depressed because I'd lo lose the object in the paint. For Wyatt, the idea was growing that an object which did not look like the real thing would never convey the full depth of its significance. The worn metal of an orlock can be made to embody the special character of Maine only through respect for that specific and individual way a thing has been worked and weathered. The tranquility, mutedness of color, and lack of firework in, of on, in On Teal's Island was the first indication that the painting was made after 1939. That supposition was confirmed recently when staff involved in the Andrew Wyeth Catalog Resume Project, through which all of Wyeth's work is being documented and cataloged, were contacted and the date of On Teal's Island was confirmed as 1944. The 1944 date allows for some interesting comparisons to works previously shown of, on, of Teal's Island. First, the 1944 watercolor, the detail of which is on the right, would have preceded Wyeth's 1945 painting of Teal in his kitchen when their friendship was new. Perhaps the watercolor was the result of an initial sighting of Teal and his glory, after which a later meeting eventually led to their close friendship. Also, the body language of both figures with legs crossed and a slightly slouched position are similar enough to think they are the same person, even though the settings are completely different. I'm going to take a minute with this next slide because I want to, as I want to make some comparisons. This is a door, this is a dory, this is a dory, this is a skiff, and this is a skiff, and up here is the uh, um, teal house. And this is a watercolor, this is a tempera, and this is a dry brush. And I'm just saying that because the titles are so similar, if I start saying them by title, I use more of the uh, description of the medium. If indeed the watercolor was painted at the beginning of Wyatt's friendship with Teal, comparing Wyatt's, Wyatt's treatment and representations of the dory and skiff in the watercolor detail on the left in the temp tempera detail on the top right, and in the dry brush on the bottom, is insightful. With people present, the dory and skiff in the watercolor appear more as mere objects and compositional devices. However, looking closely, one can see elements of the watercolor literally and figuratively reflected in the tempera and dry brush. The beach dories in the watercolor and tempera each contain the glittery reflections of water on the side of the boat, with an oar laid on top. As Wyatt was quoted saying earlier about Teal, he'd land on the beach, step the oars, and get out all in one motion. The only sound was the sea lapping on the beach and reflected on the sides of the dory. In the watercolor and dry brush, the vantage point of the two skiffs is similar. with a viewpoint from the back of the boat with their prows pointing towards Teal's house on the horizon. The significant difference is the location of the skiff in each. In the 1944 watercolor, it is pulled up on the sand, near enough to the water to be used daily. 
In the 1954 dry brush, it is located up in the grass, where, as Wyeth recalled, it was hauled up beyond the time the Zotil knew he wouldn't be using it again. One can see represented in these three paintings the progression of a friendship, from dispassionate observation in the water park to meticulous and tender portrayal in the tempera, and finally loss in the dry brush, context and meaning. Andrew Wise's painting, Burning Off, was painted in 1961, looking out from the inside of a barn on the Olson Farm in South Cushing, Maine. The Olsons, brother Alvaro and sister Christina, were neighbors of Wyatt's, and they, as well as their farm, were the subject of many of Wyatt's best-known paintings, including one of Wyatt's most famous, Christina's World, painted in 1948. Wyeth had permission to roam the Olsen farm and house at will, and his many paintings of the property and its inhabitants show his deep respect for and connection to them. For Wyeth, the Olsen siblings stood as monuments to Maine, and their home the personification of them. Asked why he painted Christina in such uncompromising detail, Wyeth replied, I think too much of her to do her another way. This quote harkens back to Wyeth's previously mentioned belief that an object which did not look like the real thing would never convey the full depth of its significance. But to Wyeth, Christina could also be represented as a de delicacy of flowers and birds on, a la on lace curtains lifted inward on a fresh west wind. And Alvaro, who refused to pose for Wyeth as a pail of clear well water behind which rose the desiccated house, its sharp angled roof gothic against the sky. Wyeth described this painting as an exact portrait of the house saying, each detail, each window, has a life of its own. The weathered clapboards in the sunlight are bathed in a bright light, yet the house had to appear both solid and hollow, firm yet destined to disappear. In the Olsen farm paintings, doorways and windows are frequent subjects. They allow views from outside looking in, as well as from inside looking out. They form strong compositional elements and are representative of features, both anatomical and architectural, that reveal character and personality, which brings us to burning off. I am here today to talk about this painting because, because of Paul Whitehead, but also, I believe, because of Grace. For the past three years, I have been working on an exhibition and catalog on Lynchburg self-taught artist, Queen Estoval. In my research, I came across an interview with her from 1971, in which she was asked to name artists whom she admired. The only artist she mentioned was Andrew Wyatt, adding that she had a book of his paintings. This information led me to research books on Wyatt that were published prior to 1971, to see if I could perhaps determine what she might have seen, and if she might have been influenced. While I did not find anything definitive related to Queen of Stovall, I did find that Burning Off, painted in 1961, was a significant work by Wyatt with an important provenance. I lamented the fact that although I had played a role in the acquisition of the painting for the museum in 1998, I had never delved deeply into the painting's history and what a lost opportunity that was. And literally, at the same time that I was lamenting this loss, Paul called me and asked me to lunch to talk about something. And here I am. Friendship and grace, context and meaning. What I found in those books and catalogs prior to 1971 was that Burning Off was included in several major exhibitions of Wyeth's work. At the Albright Knox in Buffalo, New York in 1962, in a traveling exhibition organized by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia in 1966, 
that included the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and the Art Institute of Chicago, and in 1970, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. In the 1966 Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts exhibition, Wine and his wife Betsy were involved in the selections of paintings to be included in the show, which was described in the foreword as, quote, Truly a truly definitive retrospective exhibition that included the finest examples of his work. The catalogs also mentioned the lenders to the exhibition, which included, for burning off, Mrs. Norman B. Woolworth. Norman Woolworth was the son of Woolworth's department store founder, Frederick Woolworth. The granddaddy of all five and dime stores, Woolworths was founded in 1879 and became by the late 1970s the world's largest retailer. Norman Woolworth married Pauline Stanbury in 1925 and one of their passions became collecting art. First they collected French Impressionism, but by the late 1950s they began collecting American art. Within four years, the Woolworths amassed an American art collection of 150 paintings by 80 different artists. The collection included landscape, portraiture, genre, and still life by major and minor artists of the 19th and early 20th century, and was considered at the time one of the most comprehensive private collections of American art. The Woolworths were said to have an extraordinary eye personally researching and purchasing works for their collection. Among their purchases was Rembrandt Peel's Rubens Peel with the Geranium of 1801, which when sold to the National Gallery of Art in Washington in 1985, became the highest price ever paid in auction for an American painting. The Woolworths divided their time between a New York City apartment at 720 Park Avenue and a 2,000-acre estate at Monmouth, Maine. Their art collection was so integral to their life that every summer for 30 years, from 1960 to 1990, it moved with them from New York to Maine and back to New York. <laughs> they became friends with and early collectors of Andrew Wise's work, and it is in this context that they purchased Burning Off from the artist soon after it was painted in the summer of 1961. It hung in their bedroom. In 1970, the Woolworths American Painting Collection was the focus of an exhibition in New York. With Norman's death in 1962, Pauline had become sole owner of their vast collection. The catalog for the exhibition does not, and here's the cover for it right here, uh, does not contain a checklist of works, but does have an essay as well as black and white reproductions of works in the collection shown in alphabetical order. The final page of reproductions includes three Andrew Wyeths owned by the Woolworths. One, of course, is Burning Off, and the two others are a watercolor entitled Wash Day from 1957, and a temper entitled Distance Thunder, painted in 1961, as was burning off. The three works affirm the extraordinary eye the Woolworths had as collectors. Distant Thunder, an image of Wyeth's wife Betsy, stretched across the grass on a summer day after picking blueberries, with the Wyeth's dog Rattler nearby, is considered one of Wyeth's masterpieces. Wyeth said of its creation, <coughs> The picture evolved in a strange way. I had wanted to paint my wife, Betsy, picking blueberries. I completed a number of drawings, but nothing worked. It was just somebody picking, sort of trite. I really struggled, but got nowhere, until I decided to hide. I sneaked along the edge of the woods and found her sleeping. I made a quick drawing. As I finished it, I could hear thunder way off in the direction of East Waldeboro. Suddenly, out of the grass, popped our dog Rattler's head, his ears cupped, hearing those distant sounds. The sky had that yellow cast it gets 
four big storms. All of a sudden I realized there was too much face. I painted in the hat that made the picture. <laughs> Burning off remained in the Woolworth family until it sailed to the Mayor Museum of Art in 1998. Its acquisition by the mayor was a fortuitous one. Around 1990, Pauline decided to start selling the collection, knowing money would be needed to pay estate taxes. The plan was to try to place her 150 paintings in private collections. And with Pauline's death in 1994, that, pl that plan began to be implemented. Through the Woolworths art dealer, the collection was carefully and selectively sold, and Burning Off found a new home. The stories that I have just shared, related to the Woolworths and their collection, came from recent conversations that I had with the Woolworths' former art dealer, with whom we worked on the sale. Reflecting back on the purchase from 1998, the dealer commented that over the period she was placing works, time was of the essence to meet the state tax deadlines. That, co that constraint made museum placements difficult because there was not enough time to wait for a museum to raise funds or to pay over time for a new acquisition. Paul, she asked me to acknowledge to you that your generosity in funding the purchase of Burning Off enabled an extraordinary work by Andrew Wyatt to be placed in what she considered an equally extraordinary collection of American art. compliment by letting you know that at the time of the sale, the dealer was also a member of the Woolworth family, and she was delighted that the Woolworth painting that had been a part of the family's history for almost four decades was going to become part of a new family history here at the Mayor Museum of Art. Research also uncovered a final example of the importance of burning off its inclusion in a portfolio of reproductions of 12 of Wyatt's paintings that was published in 1962 by the arts magazine Art in America. The suite of prints included an introduction by distinguished historian of American art Lloyd Goodrich, then director of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, in which he said, in 1962, the editors of Art in America proposed to Wyatt a portfolio of reproductions of his recent dry brush drawings. The artist and his wife suggested the theme, The Four Seasons, because of the essential role played in his work by the cycle of the seasons. The drawings were selected by Andrew and Betsy Wyatt from works in the house studio at Chad's Fourth supplemented by some owned by friends. With a few exceptions, they had never been exhibited or reproduced. The plates were made directly from the originals. The selection of Burning Off by Andrew and Betsy Wyatt to be included among 12 works for reproduction affirmed its importance to the artist as well as the importance of the friendship he had with Norman and Pauline Woolworth. As an aside, I have brought in that portfolio, and it is on a table over there so that you can see I'm burning off in the context, as a print in the context of the other prints that were included. However, its inclusion in the 1962 portfolio also raises a question, that of the medium, or more specifically, the technique used in its creation. The introductory text by Goodrich and the object label information on the print clearly state that the portfolio contains works by Wyatt painted using the bro dry brush technique. Yet when the painting sold to the Woolworths in 1961 through Wyatt's dealer at the time and Nobler and Company, the gallery label on the back of the painting listed the work as an original watercolor. Goodrich, Goodrich describes in the portfolio text the difference in Wyatt's painting process, saying, 
In recent years, Wyeth has used more and more the technique which he calls dry brush. The medium is watercolor on paper, but he prefers to consider it as a drawing. His regular watercolors are painted with a liquid medium and a fully loaded brush. In Wyeth's dry brush drawings, he lays in the picture in broad washes of color, but he then proceeds to work over the surface using a brush squeezed nearly dry and with additional pigment. In this process, he draws with the brush, defining the forms, enriching the textures, and building substance. But the method throughout is translucent. The whites are the white paper showing through. No opaque white is used. And he does not even scrape washes out of the whites compared to his watercolors, which are impressionistic and concerned with visual sensations, the dry brush drawings are more solid and fully realized. Subsequent to the publication of the portfolio, Burning Off is referred to both as a watercolor and as a dry brush in exhibition catalogs and on labels on the back of the painting. And while both descriptions are technically correct, Dry brush essentially being a type of watercolor technique, the fact is Wyeth himself chose to identify the work as a dry brush and selected it to be included in a published portfolio of specifically dry brush drawings. One of the qualities of burning off that most appealed to those of us who visited art dealers to select paintings for Paul and Sandra's consideration was its striking simplicity and the abstract nature of its composition. Wyeth is known and appreciated by many for his stark realism, but there is often an inherent tension present between meticulously detailed representations of people, places, and things, and an abstract quality which his work possesses. This painting, almost singularly during this period in Wyeth's career, illustrates that concept. Its 1961 date squarely within the wave of abstract expressionism that had emerged in the 1940s. Wyatt said of his work, I have said that I consider myself an abstractionist. I am. I only judge my work through its abstract excitement, whether it has an essence. That's where I tie up with Franz Klein. I like his large shapes and interesting depth. Very exciting. What is abstraction? It's just plain excitement. On the left is Klein's Torches Ma from 1960, and on the right is Slate Cross 1961, the same year as Burning Off. Wyeth goes on to say, if you turn some of my most complete pictures upside down, you'll find an abstract. It's hidden by an absolute precision and clarity, while underneath is the chaos that retains the flash of excitement that just burns. That tension and chaos is evident when looking closely at details of burning off, where the softly rendered fog lifting from delicate blades of grass in bright morning light are in sharp, sharp contrast to the coarse, dark barn interior, worked over with splatters, marks, and literally scratches into the surface of the paper. Context and meaning. In 1986, Randolph Macon Women's College received a bequest from Margaret Henry Gannon, an alumna from the class of 1920, that directed that stock be sold to purchase, quote, a watercolor painting in the tradition in the tradition exemplified by Andrew Wyatt by American painters now living. It was purchased in to be given in honor of a, of a beloved college professor, Dr. Herbert Lipscomb. With those generous funds, Jamie Wyeth's evocative watercolor, Pumpkin at Sea from 1971, was purchased from the artist dealer in New York, thus adding the work of an established artist steeped in the realist tradition, a stronghold for the Mayor collection. Jamie's artistic upbringing may have mirrored in many ways that of his father, Born in 1946 and raised in Chad's Fort, Pennsylvania, in Cushing, Maine, Jamie began drawing early in his youth. By age 13, he begged his parents to be allowed to leave school and be tutored at home so he could devote himself to drawing and painting. 
at home and under the tutelage of his Aunt Carol uh, Wyatt and his father, Jamie began to pursue an art career, initially sharing space, with, space in his father's studio. Jamie recalled in a 2016 interview that Andrew was a feverish worker who loved to play classical music loudly while he worked. Jamie preferred working alone and in silence. Often that led to Jamie stuffing his ears with cotton when they painted together. At age 15, Jamie began to focus on portraiture, choosing oil paint which allowed him a broader and brighter palette, more in keeping with that of his grandfather, N.C. Wyatt, who, as we have seen, loved color and texture. In 1963, at the age of 17, Jamie received his first commission, a portrait of Dr. Helen Brooke Tausick, pictured here, a pioneer in pediatric cardiology at Johns Hopkins University. The painting was commissioned by a group of doctors who had studied with and worked under Dr. Tausick as a way to honor her. They could not afford Andrew Wyatt's fees, but agreed when Andrew recommended his son. The finished work was to hang at the hospital among portraits of other Hopkins luminaries. In the previously cited 2016 interview, Jamie said that he recalled the gasp of horror from the, assemb the assembled crowd when the flinty, intense portrait was unveiled. Johns Hopkins did not hang the portrait, but instead gave it as a personal gift to Dr. Tossett, who, as the story goes, wrapped it in a towel and stuck it in her attic. <laughs> The rejection of the portrait had a profound impact on Jamie. He felt he had captured Tossig as an authentic, three-dimensional human being, complete with the intensity, toughness, and confidence that she had exuded during the periods of time he had spent getting to know her. And ironically, it was those traits that, it, that had enabled her to rise in a profession that in the 1960s was dominated by men and not easily accessible to women. In 1981, a more conventional portrait was painted, shown on the right. In the, 19, in the 2016 interview, Jamie acknowledged that his painting was not a Betty Crocker portrait and added that Johns Hopkins had reached out to him recently to say that after all these years, they were going to display the original portrait. The story is important because it serves as a harbinger to how and what Jamie would paint in the future. Even realism can have an edge to it. As a result of the criticism over the Tossig portrait, Jamie shied away from further commissions, including a posthumous portrait of President John F. Kennedy, requested by the Kennedy family in 1966. However, in 1967, he decided to paint Kennedy's portrait on his own. In keeping with his immersive approach to portraiture, Jamie spent hours studying photographs, movie footage, sketching John's brothers, Robert and Edward, and even talking to the president's widow, Jacqueline Kennedy. Jamie made scores of sketches of the president, determining exactly the size he wanted the composition. The final painting shows Kennedy, Contemplative, serious, and deep in thought, I focused, but, gave, but his gaze turned away from the viewer. Though direct and powerful, it measures an intimate 16 by 29 inches. In 1965, Jamie met artist Andy Warhol in New York. Jamie was there working Saturdays for two months in a Harlem morgue dissecting and drawing cadavers as a means to further understand human anatomy. Both artists participated together in NASA's Eyewitness to Space program and subsequently became friends. Their association and friendship resulted in 1976 in Jamie painting a portrait of Warhol and Warhol painting a portrait of Jamie. Like his father, Jamie grew up roaming and drawing the Chad's Ford countryside. 
As a child, he discovered T.H. White's The Once and Future King, where Merlin the Magician educates Arthur Pendragon by transforming him into animals. In his youth, Jamie developed a special fondness for the barnyard animals that ran free on Matty Ball's farm near his parents' home. And so it is not surprising that as an artist, the subjects of Jamie's paintings were agrarian, chickens, barns, dogs, and pigs. When the Balls had to give up their farm, Jamie took responsibility for the animals and moved them to his own farm, Lookout Point. In 1970, Jamie completed this meticulously detailed four foot by seven foot painting of his barnyard favorite, Den Den, a big sow with a crooked snout. In 1984, Jamie painted his beloved yellow lab cleaver. The circle around his eye had become a permanent addition, initially painted on impulse as a tribute to the dog Petey in the 1920 short films Our Gang, and then because both Visitor and Kleber liked it. Jamie explained that the dog got too close to his easel one day, and he dip, dipped his brush into black paint and per, put a circle around his eye. With people remarking that they liked it, Jamie said, Kleber looked at me, and I looked at him, and we decided that the marking was here to stay. <laughs> Jamie eventually used mustache dye because it would last longer, and said the dog seemed to enjoy the notoriety his marking gave him. <laughs> Jamie has called himself a diarist or recorder of everyday events and people, saying, I hate the idea of now I'm creating a painting for an audience. My painting is simply recording my life and thoughts as if I were doing a diary. Whether I'm painting a person or a seagull or a pig, I like to think that if the pig painted, he'd paint himself exactly the way I was doing it. That's what thrills me. Jamie's assimilation with his subjects allows for personality, expression, and humor to emerge. In that respect, he is like his father, Andrew, quote, equating himself with the object to the point that he becomes the object itself. And like his grandfather, N.C., he revels in the richness of heightened color and texture. In 1968, at the age of 22, Jamie purchased a home on Monhegan Island. It's right here. And um, I also want to point out Booth Bay right here, where Paul and Sandra have a home. Uh, Ten miles due east from the coastal town of Cushing, Maine, where he spent summers with his family. Monhegan Island is 4.5 square miles of rock and forest rising out of the North Atlantic, with no cars and no central electricity. It was a haven of solitude and had been a destination for many artists starting in the early 1900s. Both Edward Hopper on the left and George Bellows on the right were among those drawn to the rocky coast and beautiful vistas. Monhegan Island eventually developed into a popular tourist destination, so Jamie developed a method to maintain his privacy and hide from the curious by setting up his easel in an old plywood fish bait box, which he used in the grass and on the rocky coast. The house on Monhegan Island that Jamie purchased belonged to artist Rockwell Kent, whom Jamie admired. Kent had moved to Monhegan in 1905, and once there appreciated the land's rugged primordial beauty. Encouraged to go to Monhegan by his teacher and mentor, American artist Robert Henry, Ken, Ken found his voice there, developing his unique, bold, stylized composition. In 1910, Kent left the island and traveled, seeking out parts of the world that had striking and rugged landscapes, including Newfoundland and Greenland. In the 1920s, he returned to Monhegan, a mature artist, and painted these two works. Kent settled into island life, working as a lobsterman, carpenter, and handyman to support himself, and built a house and studio on the rocks overlooking the ocean. Jamie's 1972 portrait of Kent House <coughs> contains all the honesty, directness, and intensity 
of his portraits of people, with the house standing tall, starkly, and defiantly poised against a bright blue sky. The drama is heightened by the low vantage point and, like Kent, the use of a strong horizontal to divide the canvas. Pumpkin at Sea includes the Kent house on the left, but only as a sliver, a perpendicular foil to the tenuous and dangerously placed horizon line running through the exact center of the painting. We know the watercolor contains the Kent house by comparing in each painting the roof line and gutter here, right here, running down the side of the house. While Kent House does not take center stage in Pumpkin at Sea, the painting is part of a series of portraits that Jamie painted in the 1970s of houses on Monhegan Island. <coughs> Most of these houses were built before 1930, and several were designed by Kent, who interestingly died in 1971 at the age of 89. Kent once wrote Jamie that among the less fortunate monuments he had left on the island were two houses that mirrored each other exactly, inside and out. Jamie painted them in 1969, as part of his portrait series, entitled the work Twin Houses. In this painting, these twins appear absorbed in their complete attention to each other, as though in face-to-face -face private conversation the world be damned. Built to withstand the ravages of the time and the sea, their foundations are anchored to the very rocks themselves. In Bow Time, painted in 1976, the house engages and welcomes the viewer, its architectural features and color exuding warmth and personality, while the four individuals on a balcony stand stoic and cold like statues. Jamie's tendency to see whimsy where often, Jamie's tendency is to see whimsy where often his father saw menace. In Jamie's hands, houses become grin, grinning anthropomorphic jack-o'-lanterns with the windows forming the eyes and teeth. It's akin to the mischievous smiles emanating from pumpkins peering over the side of pots, or the self-satisfied smirk his pink den-den unselfconsciously flashes as she pretends not to notice that we are marveling at her. However, as has been noted earlier, Jamie's realism can have an edge to it. This is particularly evident in a series of paintings begun in the late 1960s, of which Pumpkin at Sea is also a part. In these paintings, such as Portrait of a Lady in 1969, eight, the main subject is stationed, often in dramatic fashion, front and center, against a backdrop of horizontal bands <coughs> of land, sea, and sky. To varying degrees, Jamie creates an inherent tension with the possibility of danger looming just under the surface, as in Gull Rock from 1970. Such images can take on an almost abstract, surreal quality, where the ju juxtaposition of rectangles and spheres lock the combination tightly together, and one is left to wonder whether the orb in the center is a stemless pumpkin or possibly an orange. In Pumpkins at Sea, in oil painted in 1970, a ghost pumpkin is seen on the left, emerging or retreating beyond the rocks against an ink-black ocean. The stem on a centrally placed pumpkin cuts the horizon line, puncturing the sky like a periscope rising from the sea. The same ominous power and tension is evident in other works from this series, including New Newfoundland from 1971, Islander from 1975, Wolf Dog from 1976, Giant Clam from 1977, and The Rookery also from 1977. The acquisition of Pumpkin at Sea in 1986 includes an interesting story about how a few inquiries led to the discovery and resolution of a discrepancy in the painting's title and date. When the painting was purchased, the label on the back listed the title 
as study for pumpkins at sea with the date of 1970, which would indicate that it was a preliminary but finished watercolor sketch for the 1970 oil painting Pumpkins at Sea. The following exchange of letters regarding the watercolor between Jamie and me while I was curator at the mayor are revealing on a number of fronts. In the first letter to Jamie dated September 27, 1988, I mentioned the museum's acquisition of Study for Pumpkins at Sea, inquire about copyright, and then slip in an invitation saying, we are particularly pleased with the acquisition because of its association with an important college tradition, that of pumpkin parade. Knowing your and your family's affinity for Halloween, I have enclosed a brochure which describes the event. I would like to extend an invitation to you to visit the Mayor Museum of Art and Randolph-Macon Women's College. The Blue Ridge Mountains are particularly beautiful in the fall when the leaves are turning. And of course, on Saturday, October 29th, there is pumpkin parade, <laughs> dot, 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 dot. <laughs> on October 4th, Jamie replies to his secretary, asking for a transparency or slide of the study for pumpkins at sea to address the issue of copyright and adds, he, meaning Jamie, remarked that he enjoyed looking through the, the literature that you sent. However, although he thanks you for the invitation, Halloween must be spent at Chad's Ford, exclamation point. On October 19th, the slide is, a slide is sent, and on November 22nd, a reply is sent with surprising and important information. Thank you for sending the slide. The work is called Pumpkin at Sea, a watercolor painted in 1971. So, not only is the watercolor not a study for pumpkins at sea, its 1971 date means that it was painted the year after the oil was completed and thus stands on its own. Jamie's particular fondness for Halloween is evident in the paintings and even a print on the right that he produced. One can see in these two works a similar treatment of the pumpkin to the oil and watercolor shown previously, though the higher vantage point allows each pumpkin to cast an eerie dark shadow across the foreground. Jamie's fondness for Halloween has its roots in that holiday being a wise family favorite. Andrew painted numerous images of pumpkins, as did Jamie, as we have seen. Jamie even included a pumpkin in his 1972 self-portrait entitled Pumpkinhead. This talk has been about Andrew and Jamie Wine, about their paintings and about stories that reveal context and meaning. Andrew Wyatt's connection to this college and its art collection actually dates back to the 1940s and to the history of the annual exhibitions of American art that began in 1911 under the leadership of the college's first art professor, Louise Jordan Smith. This year, the annual exhibition will celebrate its 107th anniversary, as well as past March 28th, marked the 150th birthday of Louise Jordan Smith. In 1945, the 34th annual exhibition included Wyeth's Hogpen. See it listed right here. There, the reproduction of it. And in 1948, the 37th annual exhibition contained a work by Wyeth entitled Chandelier. which research indicates which li would likely have been one of the three works shown here. Also included, top right, is a photograph of Wyeth with the actual chandelier he painted. In the case of both these loans from the 1940s, the source would have been Macbeth Gallery, which was Wyeth's dealer from 1936 until 1953 when the gallery closed and M. Nodler and Company began representing the artist. This warrants mention because Robert McIntyre, who ran Macbeth Gallery at the time, 
had championed for years the efforts of Louise Jordan Smith to build a collection of American art, regularly lending works to the annual exhibitions and even directing gifts to the collections. In a poignant way, even Jamie Wyatt has a connection to early efforts to establish a collection of art at Randolph-Macon Women's College. As mentioned earlier, the funds to purchase Pumpkin at Sea were provided through a bequest designated in the will of Margaret Henry Gammon, class of 1920. With Gammon as a senior, 1920 was the year that the college formally established a permanent collection of American art, with the college and Lynchburg communities raising funds to purchase George Bellows' Men of the Docks. In 1986, 66 years later, the actualization of what the art collection and the college meant to Gammon was realized with the addition of competency, context and meaning. In examining On Teal's Island, Burning Off, and Pumpkin and Sea, we have traveled through the lives and legacies of three generations of Wyatt, from N.C. to Andrew to Jamie. Father and son as artists, as well as father and son as family. This journey has taken us from Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, to Cushing, Maine, and to Morgan <coughs> Island. But another important part of this journey and this story includes Lynchburg, Virginia, and Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, where travel between these two locations occurred every summer for nearly 50 years by Paul and Sandra Whitehead. From their lifelong partnership and those annual excursions came the donation of a painting and the establishment of a lecture series that is the actualization of what the Mayor Museum of Art means to them. Both will be lasting tributes to their generosity and their legacy to us all. In Booth Bay Harbor, in a home that in many ways harkens to those portrayed in the work of Andrew and Jamie Wyatt, stories formed and memories were made. Also in that home, Friendships were deepened. Thank you, Paul, for enriching not only this museum and this community with your generous gifts, but also for enriching my life with your and Sandra's presence in it. Friendship and grace, context and meaning. Thank you.